All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, as an aside, the nice thing about going last at a conference like this is that by the time you get to my talk, the part of my introduction where I have to convince you to care about the thing that I'm talking about has been addressed over and over again. Um, so hopefully that saves us some time and I won't go over my time limit. I don't wanna keep you here. Uh, specifically, I don't need to convince anyone here that treatment, res treatment resistance uh, is an important problem in cancer research. Um, but what really this slide serves to say is that the issue of uh, treatment failure due to the emergence and uh, then possible recurrence of a treatment resistant tumor um, for one, it is led in large part to the view of cancer as an eco-evolutionary process, at least in part. Um, it also drives much of the research into finding new treatment paradigms. Uh, it is also the kind of broad picture, high level conceptual motivation behind this work. So the classical paradigm of how these resistant tumors emerge is that of Darwinian evolution. Um, specifically, during the process of tumorigenesis um, and clonal expansion, some of these subclones in the tumor are going to accumulate uh, mutations that confer resistance to whatever treatment you're going to apply. And once you apply that treatment, it acts as a positive selection force on the drug-resistant genotype and phenotype. Um, kind of building on that classical paradigm in more recent years, we also have the uh, view of the eco-evolutionary process of competitive release as contributing to the emergence of these treatment resistant tumors. So the principle behind competitive release uh, is that prior to treatment, the resistant phenotype uh, is actually less fit. There's some fitness costs associated with maintaining the mechanisms of resistance. And competition with the more fit drug sensitive cells suppresses the drug resistant population. But once we apply the treatment and we deplete uh, the tumor of those drug sensitive cells, the drug resistant cells are able to expand into the ecological niche that was previously occupied by the drug sensitive cells. And taken together, kind of these views of cancer and the evolutionary processes that are involved in cancer treatment, uh, we get an understanding that the act of treatment itself is somehow causatively linked to the recurrence that we see when treatment fails. Um, and this understanding has in part motivated the development of such things like adaptive therapy, which we've heard a lot about over the past couple of days. What I'm going to be talking about is a more recent addition to the picture of the eco-evolutionary dynamics of cancer treatment. Um, and it's one that kind of complicates the classical Darwinian paradigm. And that is non-genetic acquisition of resistance. So this is something we just heard a bit about in Einar's talk and also yesterday with uh, Andre's talk. Um, so the idea here is that we have observed non-genetic heterogeneity in various cancers and cancer cell lines. Not only do we just observe heterogeneity in general, this heterogeneity is robust, it's functional, and it's also reversible. That is to say that these cells are exhibiting a level of phenotypic plasticity. In particular, the observed phenotypes that we see these cells reverting into are a more de-differentiated and more plastic state. So that might be um, mesenchymal or stem-like states. Uh, and this Phenotypic switching is often in response to the stress of any sort of uh, cytocidal, so cell killing, or targeted therapy. And these phenotypes, uh, most importantly, are associated with resistance to treatment. So they are not as easily killed by conventional therapies. So how does this complicate the classical Darwinian paradigm of cancer evolution? So for one, these phenotypes are induced by environmental stress and they are non-genetic, but in some cases they've been shown uh, to be inherited across a limited number of generations. Furthermore, the inherent existence of phenotypic plasticity means that these resistant subpopulations within the tumor are not as readily subject to extinction as in the case with resistant subclones because they can always be repopulated through phenotype switching. 
What does this mean for treatment? In the presence of non-genetic acquired resistance, uh, what we are pushing for, me and my co-author, is it's to think of it as a double-edged sword, treatment as a double-edged sword. So the act of killing cells uh, with, say, chemotherapy, not only kills the sensitive cells, uh, but also pushes some of the remaining cells into a resistant stem-like state, thus planting the seed for later recurrence. In other words, non-genetic uh, acquisition of resistance sets an intrinsic limit to how successful any given treatment uh, that involves cell stress can be. So with this more complicated evolutionary picture of cancer and cancer treatment in mind, uh, we wanted to build a mathematical model uh, because the effect of this acquired resistance has not been systematically studied in the literature until very recently. Our first goal is to develop an elementary population dynamic model for the processes of treatment-induced cell death and treatment-induced drug resistance during cancer therapy. So this is not a mechanistic model like the one that we saw yesterday for stem cell populations. Um, this is going to be a more broad population dynamic model. The next goal that we had is to evaluate the activity profiles, um, in other words, the pharmacodynamics or the dose response of a drug in inducing cell death versus inducing the transition to the resistant state. Our third goal is to quantify how these features of treatment relate to the intrinsic inevitability of recurrence uh, as measured as time to tumor progression or TTP. And finally, we wanted to provide a formal survey of the consequence of non-genetic induction of resistance by treatment, irrespective of the ensuing selection and microenvironmental influences. So once again, to stress that this is meant to be a very simple model to try and get some of the kind of core processes and core population dynamics that come from drug-induced resistance, it is intentionally kind of ignoring some of the more complicated factors. Not to say that they aren't important, but just to say what the goal of our model is. So let's get into it. Here's our mathematical model. Uh, as I said, it is a very simple model. It is maybe the most simple model you can get in terms of dynamical systems. It is a linear ODE. Uh, we have two populations, X sub S, which is the number of sensitive cells at time T, and X sub R, which is the number of drug-resistant cells at time T. And the dynamical system equations are given as follows, where we have rate constants that describe the birth and death rates of the sensitive and resistant cells. So that's given by B sub S and D sub S for sensitive, and B sub R and D sub R for resistant. And then we have these uh, phenotype switching rates. So those are the rate constants K sub S R. That's the rate at which drug sensitive cells are induced into the resistant state. And K sub R S, which is the resensitization rate of the cells. And as is fairly common in the world of dynamical systems, we can write this uh, ODE in matrix vector form. Um, and I'm doing this here because we're going to talk about some of the later analysis in terms of this matrix A, uh, which just contains our rate constants. Getting a little bit further into how we build this model, um, this is how we incorporate drug treatment into our model. We do so by saying that a set number of our parameters or a subset of our parameters uh, depend on the drug dose, which we're calling M, um, given by some dose response curve. And we use just the classical sigmoid Hill function dose response curve where up to a certain point, we get a very uh, noticeable dose response. So maybe at intermediate drug doses, we get high increases in the number of cells we killed, but after a certain point, that dose response tends to plateau. There's a saturation effect. The three parameters that we state in this model that are dependent on drug dose are the uh, cell killing rates, so the death rates of both sensitive and resistant cells, as well as the rate at which cells are induced uh, to become resistant. So this is how we model the drug-induced resistant resistance in our model. Another thing to point out here is that we have uh, a model of continuous therapy. So we just pick one constant value of M, uh, we don't modulate the dose, and we do our model analysis from there. Again, just a very basic, simple analysis of this model to start. And finally, as I mentioned, the thing that we look at in terms of our model output is the time to tumor progression or TTP. And we measure that here as the total time that it takes for the 
total tumor population, so the sensitive and resistant cells, to reach their initial uh, population size. I will be quick about this. Uh, the results, the first result that I want to talk about is a little bit more of a high level, less quantitative result, um, but I think it's important. The takeaway here is that we've heard a bit about uh, this week about the mu or U-shaped tumors. So this kind of characteristic uh, population size curve that we see where we get some initial depletion, where we start uh, cancer remission, we're ca killing off those sensitive cells successfully, but then we eventually get the regrowth of the resistant tumor. Um, and how we talk about it in this model is that it's inherently linked to a saddle point dynamics. Um, so in the tumor depletion stage, we're following some exponential curve with a uh, negative exponential growth rate, so exponential decay. And on the regrowth part, we're following exponential growth. Um, and in terms of the exact solution of our ODE, these are exactly given by the eigenvalues of our rate matrix A. Um, so I think in terms of framework, it's just a nice way to talk about it in terms of the language of dynamical systems that maybe us mathematicians are used to a little bit more. The major takeaway in terms of a more quantitative, well, I say qualitative, so maybe it's more qualitative, but we do a qualitative sensitivity analysis to see how the time to progression changes when we vary the dose response curve um, of the induction of resistance. So we look at um, low potency versus high potency to induce resistance. So that's shifting to half maximum point. And then we look at uh, efficacy low and high. So efficacy is just the maximum rate at which cells are being induced into that resistance state. And we see a couple interesting trends. I would say the most interesting is that when the potency to induce resistance is low compared to the potency to kill the cells, we get a non-monotonic dependence of time to progression on our constant drug dose. So there is some optimal drug dose where beyond that point, if we were to increase the drug dose, we're not going to be doing any better. We're in fact going to be doing worse in terms of our treatment outcomes. And very quickly, if we uh, lower the efficacy in terms of inducing resistance, we're going to get better overall outcomes. We're going to shift that time to progression curve up, prolong progression further. Um, these are not necessarily unintuitive results in that less induction of resistance is better. But I do think that the optimal uh, drug dose that's revealed in the low potency uh, is an, an interesting thing in terms of if we are to expand this model into clinical predictions. But as one last point, as I'm a little bit over time, uh, before we make any interesting or informative or useful clinical predictions, we have to ground this model in clinical or preclinical data in order to make those predictions. Otherwise, we're just playing around with a nice little toy model. Um, and that could either be through using estimates of population and pharmacodynamic parameters. Uh, so the rate constants, and some of those are in the literature, or a little bit more sophisticated way perhaps is to use some sort of statistical learning framework to fit distributions for each of our parameters. With that, I'd like to uh, thank my co-authors on this paper. Um, in particular, my advisor Hong Chen and our collaborator Sui Hong, who's at the Institute for Systems Biology. Um, I'd really like to give one last thanks to Sandy and Kristen for organizing such a wonderful conference and for providing travel support for myself and many of the other grad students here. Wouldn't be possible without you all. So I say thank you and open it up to questions. I have one. That was interesting. Um, the way you wrote your uh, description of your model, it wasn't clear, um, but it must have been um, that your uh, death terms were a function of M. They're switching yes. terms yes. and your death terms. Yes. But you never showed the functional form. Was that what the uh, the curves were? Yes, yes. If so I could. Can we see your? Yes, sorry. For the interest of time, I had left that part out. Um, but it is a very important part. Let's see right here. Okay. So is it just like a, a hill function you're using? Or? Yes. Yeah. Just a hill function. Um, and then those are, oh, there we go. Uh, yeah. Um, and so we kept, uh, those 
curves fixed for all of our model analysis. Really the only thing that we changed, all of our other rate constants, our initial conditions, we kept fixed. These dose response curves for the, the death rates, we've kept fixed. And the only thing we're changing is the half maximum point of the uh, KSR curve. So the rate at which uh, cells are induced to resistance and then the maximum point. Um, yeah. They switch both ways in this model, right? Yes, and we assume that the resensitization rate is constant. A lot of assumptions went into this. <laughs> sure. No, there's nothing yeah. wrong. I just wanted to understand it. Yes. We, mm -hmm. We've, um, I don't know if you've seen Injun Kim's work um, where we had a sensitive resistant model with switching. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we find there, obviously, when you're trying to make adaptive therapy decisions, then there's actually a kind of sweet spot in switching rate that gives you the best kind of adaptive therapy response. And if you go too far, um, you end up with like everything can become resistant and everything becomes sensitive, you know, with the, with the flip of a hat. What we've seen in data, uh, um, at least in melanoma cell lines and a few of them, is that the rate of acquiring resistance takes longer than the rate of losing it. And that that rate of losing it um, doesn't go all the way back to full sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So there's like you lose something, yeah. some sort of hysteresis. And so um, could this model account for that? Um, not, well, so yes and no. Not this model in the, the two compartment form that it currently yeah. is, but it can be easily generalized to, you have one sensitive population and then say N kind of gradient of resistant populations. Yeah. Um, so that could easily account for that kind of hysteresis behavior where you are pushed into resistance and you kind of resensitize, but no, somewhere no. intermediate yeah okay cool thanks nothing else well then thank you thank you Erin.